Welcome, Christians. We're back, and we're late, and there's a reason. Because Evan doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. No, that is not why. It's Paul's fault. Actually, it's the computer's fault. It's the computer's fault. It hates us. <laughs> we don't know what's happened. It suddenly started slowing down. Seriously, it's taking forever to save our episodes. Who knows if you'll even ever hear this episode. This is a good computer. I don't mm-hmm. know. The guy at Best Buy, when he sold me this, it was his best day ever because... He you was made just, him a lot of money. I made him a lot of money because he just kept adding things on. I was like, yep, yep. And then I walked out with this great computer, beautiful computer that I can barely do anything on because <laughs> I, I have no computer skills whatsoever. But it's really nice. It can flip open backwards. It's got mm-hmm. a touch screen. Gorgeous. So you can Google and write in WordPad and exactly. record a podcast. Absolutely. What it was intended for, certainly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the point is, we, we recorded an episode for you guys, and it was great. We were on point. We were back. We wow. We just reconnected after vacation. Uh, we were we firing were it off. funny. We were funny in that episode. We talked about socks. We'll never get those moments oh, back. Oh, that, that was a real moment. Yeah, it was a real moment. <laughs> We had a real funny bit about socks, and you never get to hear it, and we're sorry. So the sum- it's not going to be funny, but <laughs> it's like- in a moment, I asked Evan if they had socks in the 1900s. Yeah, and I was like, yeah, dumbass. Um, but I said it in a funnier way. And then we did a whole thing about... I promise about... it was really funny. It sounds lame now. Now we sound, we sound like the people at a party, but like, <laughs> listen, listen, no. Um, <laughs> and everyone's just listening, and they don't mm-hmm. care. They don't care. I'm sorry, guys. You'll never get the comedic gold that we had. But we're going to give you this episode anyways. You know why? Because Josephine Baker deserves to have her story told. She and you is guys a deserve it. badass bitch. She is awesome. She lived She lived like 30 lives in mm-hmm. one. Like She lived more life than 30 people combined. Mm-hmm. And it's an amazing story. And it was going to wrap up our Black History Month and just like cinch it in a nice yep. little bow. And then fucking computer. So what happened was I saved our project, mm-hmm. put it on the USB drive, the whole thing that we always do, transferred it to my computer, and when I opened it to edit it, it decided to tell me that I was missing some audio files. Mm-hmm. So Evan rushed back and we tried to find the missing audio files. Tried to resuscitate it. But there was, it was hopeless. It was hopeless. It, it was too was late. It was gone. And it was like, it was Tuesday night, late at night. We weren't going to get another episode done for you guys. So we just Evan had worked like 20 hours that day. <laughs> yep. I had. I work very early on Tuesdays. So anyway, so we decided to give you two other. So if you, you caught, you saw we, we did a little mini episode on, you know, like your family and, and you know, how do you set boundaries with family? What do you do with family that um, isn't accepting of you as a queer individual? We just talked about our own experiences. So check that out. And we're also got your regular scheduled episode that's going to drop this Wednesday. We'll be back to our regular Wednesday episodes, but we still wanted to give this to you guys. I'm doing all the talking because Paul has. I'm shoved, shoving pizza in my mouth. He's sorry. shoving things in his mouth, you know. And you would think with as as much room as he's made in there through the years, <laughs> he'd be able to put some in there and still talk. But no, I can, but <laughs> I prefer to eat first. Nah, swallow. Mm-hmm. You know how to do that. Only way. <laughs> Breathe through your nose. <laughs> That's why. Another reason why I could not give a good blowjob. I tried. We were talking about that, you know, mm-hmm. about blowjobs, about nibbling on the tip versus swallowing it whole. What do you think? Take our poll. <laughs> Tweet us. <laughs> <laughs> Tweet us. Do you nibble or do you swallow? Um, anyways, uh, so um, because we, it's been a little while, how have things been? Things have been great. So... Mm-hmm. Let's re-catch up on everything we caught up in the last <laughs> Yeah, time. everything that we already fucking talked about. So, so I went on a cruise. Yep. Super fun. Did everything I Didn't never drown. thought I would ever do. No, I actually almost drowned two years ago. But I went snorkeling <laughs> in the open ocean, and mm-hmm. it was a great time. Yeah. Saw an octopus in the water. Nice. You weren't scared? No. No, I wasn't. It went under a rock. It, like, ran away. Oh, whatever. It wasn't, like... It wasn't, like, mm-hmm. in your face? Yeah, I, like, ran under a rock. You just got in my face with your big eyes and reminded me of the Momo Challenge. I don't want to see that. I don't like it. You hear about that? <laughs> Do you know what the Momo Challenge is? No, I don't, but I didn't like the picture, so I don't <laughs> want... The Momo Challenge is to kill yourself. Oh. Yeah, and the fucked up thing is it goes on little kids' YouTube videos. No. I, do, I mean, I read something about how, like, it harassed little kids. Yeah, so it goes yeah. on... A, so a little kid will be on YouTube Kids, uh-huh. and they'll be watching, like, um, I don't know... 
this little girl's like toy review and the little uh, girl will be talking about her toys and then all of a sudden the face will pop up and be like uh, hey it's momo again oh wow and then it'll say did you boys and girls do everything momo said well momo needs you to do something else uh-huh. i need you to go get your sharpest toy or one of your mom's kitchen knives grab it by the handle and put it against your wrist and then do this and slice if it. If you do it right, a bunch you'll see a bunch of red stuff. It's going to hurt, but you have to do it for Momo. And if you don't do it, Momo's going to come hurt you. Okay. Yeah, that scary ass face. Could you imagine? I would have, as soon as that face popped up, I'd turn that <laughs> off. I don't care how old I was. I'd be like, nope. I didn't even go in my basement for the first 15 years of my life. So I'm not... I, <laughs> There's no way I would have listened to that. But I heard that it was fake, though. Like, I'm seeing reports now. Well, no, now it really comes it, up on video. It really has. Uh, point is, it's dead now. Whatever it is. Hopefully, yeah. And hopefully, hopefully if it Maybe was... that's what corrupted our files. And ho- Maybe. And hopefully, yeah. whoever made those, if they were real and they were really, like, con- mm-hmm. trying to convince people to hurt themselves, yeah. hopefully whoever fucking did it gets in a lot of trouble. Oh, yeah. Because that's, like, a really fucked up thing to do. Oh, yeah. Especially going after kids. It'd be one thing if you fucking posted it as, like, a joke video just randomly, but, like, on children's videos. Yeah, Targeting exactly. children. Like, mm-hmm. that's fucked yeah, up. Yeah, no, that's, that's way too far. That's awful. Anyways, I don't know how we got under the mobile thing. Oh, because your big creepy eyes. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. Um, anyways, so on a lighter note, um, so good, you came back from your cruise. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been very busy. Samantha and I are in the process of buying a house. And also... And also planning our wedding. And we're going to do it all in the same month. We close on the house and we have a wedding in the same month. Because when we do things, we do it all the way. We might even pop out a baby in the middle of all that. Probably. <laughs> so it's going to be a birth. Boom, right there. there. I don't know why it made that noise, but it was a really aggressive just birth. Samantha it's standing there out at and once. the baby just falling. And we're like, there we go. Family, house, marriage, we're all done. Momo in the basement? Mm, nope, don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. Do you even have a basement? Yes, I do. It's, oh. a, it's nice, actually. It's half finished, but it's got oh, heat yeah, yeah, in yeah, it. I remember. It's nice. It's got a big area. You so need to show me that. That's right. I'm going to do uh, like... Half gym, half like. I'm gonna come use your gym instead of getting a membership. Fine, I don't care. Once I get my gym built, I mean, I got to get all my pieces. But I like, expect it there the day after the wedding. Um, it's gonna take a little bit of time, you know, because I got to get my bench, <laughs> got to get a treadmill, got to have the essentials, my dumbbell rack. But I got big plans, okay. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, in a couple of years, it'll end up being turned into a kid's playroom, of course, mm-hmm. with all my gym stuff crammed into mm-hmm. a corner. But that's okay. Never for a couple used. years. Never being used. <laughs> exactly. As I become a 40-year-old dad with a beer belly and no beer. So, good things in my future. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyways, we hope you guys have been doing good, though. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh. it's been a while. It's been a, a, a moment. And it we has. haven't been as active on social media either because we've been so busy. But, exactly. But we're back. We're still mm-hmm. here. We didn't go anywhere. We did not. We are just... Living yeah. our lives, and we're gonna we're gonna drop some mini episodes for you to kind of keep up with some of the content because we won't be as active on social media for the next month and a half. But like I said, because I'm getting married and Paul has to help me get married, and I'm and also starting a business. Exactly. So he's got his shit. I've got my shit. So, but we will be dr- dropping as much content, audio content for you as right. you can, and then in the summer we'll get back to some more video content and such. Um, we still need your help if you're a Patreon supporter, though, because that's what keeps this audio content coming. Yeah. We're going to have yep. a little studio in my house. I've already got the room picked out. I got the uh, So basically ready. all of the stuff that I need is going to be at Evan's house, so exactly. I never have to get it. Exactly. See how that works out? I'm going to get it all. Get and yourself a friend. Paul come over to my house, and then we're going to sit in our studio and... Talk and talk. And, and talk to ourselves. And talk to ourselves. <laughs> and Samantha's going to be like, are you ever going to get done recording in there? So it's going to be yeah, great. Yeah, instead of hearing David scream at video games, you're just going to hear on the door. Samantha, yeah. Or Samantha, you know, watching some weird YouTube video. <laughs> and just... Because... Ah! <laughs> 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 laughing. Is that how she laughs? That's how she laughs. That's not how she laughs. She's going to hear this. She doesn't listen to our episodes. She, no, she doesn't. That's sad. <laughs> David doesn't either. Partners listen. never do. Partners are like, I have to hear your voice 23 hours a day. I can go one hour without yeah. it. That's the truth. That's just the truth. Anyways, I guess we should get into this episode because we got to blow through this. We got other stuff to do. Yep. Josephine Baker, though, everyone. <sighs> You're going to enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> I thought your computer yeah. shut off. No, I'm, I lose my fucking mind. All right. Josephine Baker. And again, real quick, last, dec- la- another dec- 
disclaimer uh, as we wrapped up our um, Black History Month stuff. Again, we realized we're two white guys talking about Black History. We wanted to honor the month. We didn't have the equipment or the ability to invite on guests as we would like to do. Hopefully in the future we can do that, especially now that we'll have a little studio set up mm-hmm. in a couple months and we'll have better equipment and access, but we didn't have that, but still, still wanted to do the best we could. So please bear with us. We understand, um, you know, and, and use the resources that we, uh, we recommend because they're all written by, uh, people of color and and, they're all really good. Yeah. They're all really good stuff. So without further ado, Josephine Baker on June 3rd, 1906 in St. Louis, how do you say St. Louis? Louis. Okay, why do I want to say Louis? Is that Louis and like a different... People say like, meet me in St. Louis. Okay, that's probably why. On June 3rd, 1906 in St. Louis, Missouri, Frida Josephine McDonald was born to Carrie McDonald and Eddie Carson. Josephine's parents were both former slaves slaves of African and Native American descent. Carrie made her living as a washerwoman, and Eddie was a professional vaudeville drummer. And apparently being a vaudeville drummer was an exciting career because shortly after Josephine's birth, her father abandoned the family. However, it should be noted that Josephine's son debates the validity of Eddie as his grandfather. In the biography, Josephine, the Hungry Heart, Jean-Claude states the following. The records of the city of St. Louis tell an almost unbelievable story. They show that Josephine Baker's mother, Carrie McDonald, was admitted to the exclusively white female hospital on May 3rd, 1906, diagnosed as pregnant. She was discharged on June 17, her baby, Frida J. McDonald, having been born two weeks earlier. So why six weeks in the hospital? especially for a black woman of that time who would customarily have had her baby at home with the help of a midwife. Obviously, there had been complications with the pregnancy, but Carrie's chart reveals no details. The father was identified on the birth certificate simply as E.D.W. I think Josephine's father was white. So did Josephine. So did her family. People in St. Louis say that Baker's mother had worked for a German family around the time she became pregnant. He's the one who must have got her into that hospital and paid to keep her there all those weeks. Also, her baby's birth was registered by the head of the hospital, and at the time when most black births were not. I have unraveled many mysteries associated with Josephine Baker, but the most painful mystery of her life and the mystery of her father's was the mystery of her father's identity, and I could not solve. The secret died with Carrie, who refused to the end to talk about it. She let people think Eddie Carson was the father, and Carson played along, but Josephine knew better. Well, she probably told him that EDW meant like Edward. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, that's uh, Mm -hmm. Eddie. Yeah, Edward. Exactly. And so, I mean... That's the thing. So this is this is Jean Claude, who was actually Josephine's foster son, mm-hmm. not her son, but we'll talk a little later on, you know. Um, but it's just still her child, and um, and he did. And I, I said, I've said before, like when you read biographies written by family members, you have to be careful because a lot of times they're very biased. But from all the reviews, you have to be careful because if I was to write a biography about my mom, I would mm-hmm. write it how I saw my mom. I wouldn't right. write it what my mother did. Who my mother... Like, it would be from my perspective. It's very hard to be objective. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But it does seem, from all the reviews and, and things that I read, that John claude did a lot of research and really tried to paint a very um, open picture of his mother. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure it was... I was not able to get access to the book. I wanted to, but I couldn't get access to it. It is on Amazon. I just... I couldn't buy it, and it wasn't available at any of our libraries. But from everything I read and from the excerpts I read from it, you know, he seemed to, like, try not to be too biased. Right. You know, just present the story of her life. So regardless of the truth behind Josephine's birth, eventually, Carrie, her mother, settled down with a man who is described as a kind but perpetually unemployed man who was named Arthur Martin. Their family eventually grew to include a son and two more daughters, and they all found a home at 212 Targi Street in the Mill Creek Valley neighborhood of St. Louis, which was a racially mixed low-income neighborhood near Union Station. Oh my goodness. It's all because you're just shoving that pizza down your throat. Consisting mainly of rooming houses, brothels, and apartments with no indoor plumbing. With no indoor plumbing. No indoor plumbing. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what that accent was. I, I don't but know. But <laughs> what the neighborhood lacked in comfort, it made for, up for in entertainment. Josephine's childhood neighborhood was home to many vaudeville theaters that doubled as movie houses. So... We talked about this last time, but mm-hmm. brothels without indoor plumbing. Yeah. Now imagine how okay, 
Mm. I'm assuming most brothels just by nature are not very clean. That's just well, the yeah, exact. Well, most of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean higher, there are higher end brothels. I'm sure, know. but we're talking. This is in a very poor neighborhood. But in the early 1900s, and it had no under plumbing. So, like, mm. Um, mm, I'm just gonna say that that's probably not. It's not. I don't know. Where do you clean yourself up at? After? Exactly. Like you just have all this cum on you, and you got to wipe it off. And, and you got the next wipes. guy in five minutes. You're on exactly. an appointment schedule. There's got to be just a wet towel that you leave by your bed and wipe and yourself everybody shares down. It. It's a lot of cum on that towel. <laughs> is it water or is it cum? At the end of the day, you don't know. You just well, wring no, it, it out. No, if, it, if it was cum, it would be like solid. Exactly. Like, sar- like snaps sheet. in half. Yeah. Oh, mm. good stuff. Mm. But anyways. Um, <clears throat> the excitement. The excitement of show business left a lasting impression on the young girl who searched for an escape amid the harsh demands that deep poverty bring. By age eight, Josephine was working as a live-in domestic worker to middle-class white families in St. Louis. By the fifth grade... She had dropped out of school to work full time, and she actually never completed a formal education. By age eight years old, that is what life as a poor individual, but especially a poor person of color in the mid nineteen hundreds, was like. Yeah, was like yeah. So, in our episode on Lucy Hicks Anderson, we discussed the hard labor of domestic housework in the early nineteenth century. So, go back and listen because we really kind of went into it with the low wages, the long hours. So particularly for women of color, uh, in addition to the long hours and endless demands, some employers could be deliberately cruel. So again, you got to listen to it because, I mean, like you would work 16, Mm -hmm. sometimes 20 hours a day, which meant you slept for four hours. You had to be on call constantly. But in addition to that, on the top, you have some employer that was mean. So one of Josephine's mistresses, the term used, burned the young girl's hands when Josephine put too much soap in the laundry. So it didn't say how she burned her hands. I don't know what Mm -hmm. she did. But yeah, she burns her hands because this little girl who's fucking eight doing your laundry, you asshat. And she puts too much soap in and you decide to burn her hands. She doesn't fucking know how much soap to use. She doesn't even fucking know how to do anything. Exactly. And that's the whole thing. This is what the tangent that I got on last time. And I'm going to do it again about the labor. So this is early 1900s. This is right before the labor union strikes. And the reason for the labor union strikes was because these conditions were so awful. Not just for people of color, especially for people of color. But any person. Any person who was not of the upper class, Mm. upper or upper middle class, had to work in these awful factories. Children are going to work at age eight. They're working these 14-hour days. They're not getting an education. People are not able to feed themselves, and they're making these factory workers millions of dollars. So finally, we have the the union strikes where people are like, no, you can't do this. Mm. And and the country institutes labor laws. And it is relevant to today's minimum wage um argument because people are like well you know the minimum wage is just you're just supposed to get started you're not supposed to earn a living that's fucking false the the labor unions the reason was that people needed to be able to earn a minimum wage to survive that is why we did that because people were not surviving before so we said here's the minimum wage that you need to survive as a human being you know what's happened today you can no longer survive on a fucking minimum wage on the minimum wage when it was established a, mm-hmm. a man could work a minimum wage job full time support his himself his wife and his two children exactly and own a house with a white picket fence and a car two cars like could go out could go party could go to concerts i don't know about co partying you would you would at least you i don't know if you could go party well uh, by go party i mean go to the bar and hang out i don't mean like go blow shit tons of money on drugs and stuff but i mean i mean you could at least live comfortably you could feed your family you could have a roof over your head you could own a car and you could do that on one person's income right you know and today two parents work full time and can barely do all those things without a kid without a kid Without a kid, exactly. Mm-hmm. Like Samantha and I, I mean, we could, uh, uh, you know, support a kid, but we both, we both, Samantha has a college education. Mm-hmm. I've been working in my field for 10 years and we worked our way up and now we're at a point at fucking 30 where we can support a family. And mm-hmm. that's another reason why people are getting married later because you have to fucking work all, the, all that time to gain enough seniority, to gain enough money, to be able to support your family. When you worked 
when the minimum wage was established, you could work a full-time job at minimum wage and pay your college tuition. Which was the fucking point. You didn't have to get a loan. You exactly. could just pay the college tuition. And now people are like, oh, I don't know why people, oh, these mothers, well, you know, they, they want more than $15 an hour to flip burgers at, at McDonald's. Well, fucking don't go to McDonald's, asshat. If you don't want to pay somebody, if you can't own a business and pay someone a living age, you don't get to be a business owner. So if you're a business owner, you listen to me. If you can't run your business and hire an employee and pay them a living wage, you don't get to be a business owner. And also, why are we mad at the people who want to make more money? Why yeah. aren't we mad at the people who don't want to pay us? Like, that makes no sense. It doesn't. It, it's like it's like that thing, that meme that we said where, where it goes around where, like, you know, people are like, why should a McDonald's worker make $15 an hour when an EMT only makes $15 an hour? Why the fuck is an EMT making $15 an hour? Why is this guy working hard, saving lives, and making $15 an hour? Makes- the issue is not that the McDonald's worker needs to make... It shouldn't, should make less money. The issue is the EMT is not making enough money. So raise his wage and then raise the McDonald worker's wage. Like, why is this a fucking problem? And it's not an issue of not being able to afford it because we have so many millionaires and billionaires in this country exactly. because of the people working at an underpaid rate. Yeah. Like, it's not because they can't afford it. They're why just is not it that the it? Walton family will never have to work again that own Walmart? They, none of them will ever have to work again. All their generations after them will not have to work again. These are not young rich kids that are like they are in there these are people that for generations they have never held a job because granddaddy a hundred years ago made so much money that the four generations after him and still continuing still do not have to work jobs and we are okay with that we are okay with mothers starving and their children starving so that Johnny Walton what the fuck doesn't have to work a job are you fucking kidding me I can't get it. I I can't (laughs) write my mind about it. Hey Queerstians, do you own a business? Are you an author or an entertainer? And would you like a great way to grow your audience? Well, this commercial slot could be yours. For just $20 a month, we can advertise your show on our podcast. And as a rapidly growing queer content source, we want to help get your name out there. So if you want even more promotion, you can just choose our $30 tier to get ads and links on our website. And for only $40 a month, we'll review your product on our YouTube channel and link it to all of our social media. So go ahead, send an email to your queer story at gmail today or reach out to us on social media via messenger and let us make your business a little more queer bye, bye. anyways we yeah. got to come back um yeah where yeah. are we at we're, we're, we're here to the <laughs> point where this little eight-year-old girl is having her hands burned by her mistress because she's being forced to work a job and apparently that's what the fuck america wants to go back to because america we pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> let's make our children work in factories because that's what real people do okay i'm okay i'm fine <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you go ahead you started so at 13 um she left domestic work and picked up a job as a waitress at old Shuff- at an old chauffeur's club on Pine Street. She also lived as a street child in the slums of St. Louis, sleeping in cardboard shelters, scavenging for food and garbage cans, making a living dancing on street corners. And again, I um, th- this was not because her family had kicked her out of her ho- their home. This was regular for children because the families were so poor that the children at age 13, they're like, well, now you're on your own. So right. again, that's what you want to return to rather than taxing the mil- billionaires, you fuckheads. <laughs> Go ahead. So it was at the old chauffeur's club where Josephine met Willie Wells and married with him the same year. Yes, that's right. 13 years old, she was married. Mm -hmm. Um, However, the marriage, surprisingly, lasted less than a few (laughs) years. And Josephine uh, said she was incredibly unhappy. We did try to find out more information for you guys, but there wasn't much. We don't know how much older he was uh, than her other than... Or the circumstances surrounding their marriage and quick divorce. But after leaving Wells, Josephine found work with a street performing group called the Jones Family Band. Yeah, not a lot of information on Willie. Um, he was, we we can't tell from his position. He worked at the Pullman Company. He was older. Mm-hmm. But how much older, I don't know. We don't know why she married him, if she really liked him, or if it was like she wanted to stop sleeping on the streets. Don't blame her. Right. I don't know, but it was... If I marry him, I can have food in a bed. Exactly, but then he was abusive, and she was very unhappy, and so then it, mm-hmm. it, it fell apart. So then at age 15, less than two years after her marriage to Wells, Josephine met another Willie. This time... She loved the Willie. Willie's a good. Everybody loves the Willie. I don't like a Willie, actually. <laughs> I've tried a lot, but I just... 
I don't know. I don't know what it is. You know, I just wait for myself to evolve and be more open to it, and I just can't. You know? You're I, missing out. I Apparently, that's what they say. <laughs> um, t- <laughs> so this time, this was Willie Baker. And in 1922, the two wed. So by age 15, she's been married more mm-hmm. than... Most people had their whole lives. That's okay. Um, While Josephine seemed happier with this union, she had officially been bitten by the showbiz bug. Though she tried to make the marriage work, she, Willie, and Josephine's mother all had different ideas on Josephine's responsibilities as a wife. Nothing better than your mother butting into your relationship. Keep your parent out of your marriage. I know, right? Keep your family... Keep everyone out of your marriage. It's your marriage. Yeah. Like... Why are you butting in? Yeah. Yeah. Do your marriage, do you, do your, talk about your issues. When you bring other people into it, that's when you start to fuck shit up. Because yep. everybody has a different yep. idea and mm-hmm. you know what? Your do parents, you. your in-laws, your siblings, your best friend even, mm-hmm. honestly. Like, not to say that you don't talk to your best friend about things. Yeah, but vent, like, talk, yeah. but but don't, yeah, but if don't drive yeah. drama between the, everybody. Yeah. So Carrie, Josephine's mother, was disappointed in Josephine's pursuit as an entertainer and believed her daughter belonged at home as a doting wife. Willie seemed to agree, and the two fought constantly over Josephine's refusal to leave vaudeville to leave her vaudeville troupe. In 1925, when the group booked a gig in New York, Josephine refused to stay home. This was their final fight. The budding star left her husband, taking nothing from him but his name. As her career was breaking through, Josephine McDonald felt her name held a better ring as Josephine Baker. And it did. And it did. we talked about this last time, but again, it was fucking lost. If you're dating someone who doesn't want you to pursue your dreams, stop yeah, dating them. That's not exactly. worth it. It's I have my own goals. David has his own goals. Evan yep. has his own goals. Mm-hmm. Samantha has her own goals. And if you're dating someone who wants you to not pursue your goals so they can only pursue their, theirs and have mm-hmm. you like at home or whatever, like it's just not worth it because maybe you're happy now and you want to make the excuse, oh, whatever, he loves me. I'm never going to find someone like this or whatever you might, what excuse you might be making. Ten mm-hmm. years down the road, you're going to say, fuck, I wasted ten yeah. years of my life. Yeah. I wasted ten years that I could be working on that goal. I wasted ten years that I could have been working on that passion. Yeah. How often do we see young kids that are like, I'm not going to go off to college because I'm dating this boy, I'm dating this girl. Really? This person. like, Or, uh, you know what? We're not saying you have to go to college, but like, don't give up anything. Yeah, well, yeah, whatever it is. College, you're not going to take that job. You're not going to... I'm not going to go you know, travel the world. Yeah. I'm not going to go visit this country or the state or you know just yeah you're not going to pursue that that job in entertainment this is what you wanted to do but oh you found the person this is my person if you're 19 it's not the person i'm sorry <laughs> it's just fucking not and if they really really are they'll come with you or right you know or you'll make it work and if you can't make it work it's not meant to be there's nothing worse i'm gonna tell you the older you get the harder it is to fr- to pursue your dreams it really is and yeah. i'm only 30 and i know this i can't imagine yeah you know so yeah, kids, live your life. They'll they'll come along. Don't worry, you're not going to be lonely. And if you are, so what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you'll survive. <laughs> you'll be okay. So it is possible there was another reason for Josephine to officially end things with Willie, which they didn't officially end things for actually about a decade, much like the way I was married for four <laughs> months, but technically, legally was married for, what, like six years? years? Yeah. Seven, six or seven years I was legally married, but I was only together for four months. It takes a long time. Divorce is a fucking bitch, kids. Again, so don't get married when you're young because it's a bitch to get out of it. So... um but yeah, but during her escape to New York, 19, the 19-year-old had fallen for esteemed novelist Georges Simenon. I don't know, S-I-M-E-N-O-N. Simenon. Simenon? Simenon. Simenon. <laughs> I just don't We just know. need a whole podcast of us trying to say names. Just That'd be fun. clips of us. The two carried on their affair for a while before Josephine sent the divorce papers to Willie. That, that wasn't true. That was later. Um, perhaps she waited because she wasn't sure if this fling was worth ending her marriage. According to Josephine's son, Jean-Claude, this wasn't her first affair. She had also carried on with a blues singer back home before leaving for the big city. A blues singer by the name of Clara Smith whose on-stage nickname was Queen of the Mosers. Of Queen of the Mosers. You ruined the, I ruined whole, the whole thing. thing. No, no, no. Just, just a, whose on-stage nickname was Queen of the Moaners. 
That's the best stage name. It's the best lesbian stage name, Queen of the Moaners. Uh, I'm sure That's she was. That's a good was. gay stage name, too. Yeah, it's just a good name, Queen of the Moaners. And she she was pretty, but Josephine was... Josephine was gorgeous. Josephine was gorgeous. You I questioned up... things when I... I, looked, I was like, <laughs> wait a minute. Wow, she was. <laughs> I was really confused. I, I, I got a little hot. I'm very hot bothered. We'll, we'll include know what was some pictures, on. but if you, if you can't wait, look her up right now. Josephine Baker... She was fucking something. <laughs> um, and she was a bisexual. So she, um, her whole life, her, um, you know, she dated men and women. She was very fluid with her sexuality her entire life. It was never an issue for her. She did marry a few men, but also marrying women wasn't an option. Right. Um, so it was know. a different yeah, time, set, know, time yeah. different mindset. Like, you know, it, it wasn't an option. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It just is a yeah, lot. When it's not an option, it, it really shapes a lot. You know? It does. It really does. And as her love life and especially sex life flourished, so did Josephine's career. When the Jones, band fa- when the Jones family band split, she tried to advance as a chorus girl for the Dixie Steppers in Sissel and Blake's production, Shuffle Along. She was rejected because she was too skinny and too dark. Undeterred, she learned the chorus line's routines while working as a dresser. Thus, Josephine was the obvious replacement when a dancer left. On stage, she rolled her eyes and purposely acted clumsy. The audience loved her comedic touch, and Josephine was a box office draw for the rest of the show's run. The star then t- started picking shows on off-Broadway productions before eventually landing roles on the chorus line of huge Broadway reviews. She was so successful as a dancer that she was billed at the time as the highest-paid chorus girl in vaudeville. Unfortunately, like many vaudeville entertainers during the time, her career began with blackface comedy at local clubs. This was the entertainment of which her mother had especially disapproved. However, these performances landed Baker an opportunity to tour in Paris, which would launch her solo career and change the course of her life. Yeah, so I mean, there's been a lot in the news lately about blackface, obviously, Mm -hmm. because, you know, all these... um, you know, young white boys went off to universities and thought it would be super hilarious to do blackface and dress up as KKK members when they were in college. And now 30 years later, they're like, oh my God, it was, apparently it's offensive. I don't know. Like, I, the 80s weren't that far away. I'm sorry. People yeah. thinking, it's the 80s. Really? But we weren't that dense. Right. Like, this is 20 years after the Civil Rights You knew what you were doing was offensive. Exactly. You knew what you were doing. You just didn't realize it was going to come back to bite you in the ass. That's right. the whole you thing. You thought you were being a funny badass. Yeah. I don't have any sympathy for the, the you know, these Virginia lawmakers, you know, and I'm sure there's many more, but for, in particular who are like, mm-hmm. I just didn't know. First of all, own the fuck up to it. Just be like, yeah, I was an asshole. I was 18, 19. I was an idiot. Um, through the years, I grew. I learned. I'm very sorry. Instead of like the Virginia governor lying and saying that it wasn't even him, <laughs> he's like that. That wasn't even me. They're like, um, actually. It, it, I mean, they tagged was. you in the picture, but sure, I guess I guess the yearbook got it wrong. <laughs> like, uh, uh, it's just <laughs> whatever. But it's but you know, but part of this whole thing is like you know the worst part. Well, I don't know the worst part. I'm speaking as a white guy who doesn't know. But I would imagine one of the more humiliating things is, is for a, a person of color to have to be in blackface to make fun of your own cu- culture. Right, because they had to darken their own skin, too. They had, yeah. like, they had to use the same like paste or whatever it was that yeah. everybody else used. Yeah, shoe polish was a lot of things yeah. that, was, that was used. Yeah, they had to do the same thing. Yeah. And degrade themselves further so that a bunch of white people in the audience could laugh at them so that they could earn a paycheck. and, and Right, know, and not have their... to work a miserable job. Exactly. Not have to work the factories and domestic work that most people of color had to work. Right. <clears throat> so, but the one thing was that Josephine was able to catch a break and get to Paris. Yes. So on October 2nd, 1925, Josephine sailed for Paris. All alone, by the way, with All nothing. Alone. No money. I mean, I'm sure she had like a pocket of change, to you get know, in, yeah. and just enough to probably get something, but mm-hmm. she had nothing. She was just yeah. like... All alone. And this is before technology. Like, yep. she couldn't check in with her mom or anybody. Like, she just fucking mm-hmm. sailed. Yeah. All alone. And she was okay, so you can do it too. <laughs> in a 1974 interview with The Guardian, she explained that she obtained her first big break in the city of love. The writer recorded her story as such. No, I didn't get my first break on Broadway. I was only in the chorus and shuffle along in chocolate dandies. I became famous first in France in the 20s. I just couldn't stand America, and I was one of the first colored Americans to move to Paris. Oh, yes, Bricktop was there as well. Me and her were the only two, and we had a marvelous time. 
course, everyone knew who was anyone knew Bricky, and they got to know Miss Baker as well. <laughs> Bricky. That's such Bricky. a 1920s name. <laughs> is, and my friend Bricky here. I just I just imagine that everybody in the twenties wore flapper dresses and danced out. I bet it was so like I bet it was a really pretty time though, because well, all the girls were in, in Paris. Flappers. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm sure it's gorgeous. Um in Paris, she became an instant success for her erotic dancing and for appearing practically nude on stage, which she actually was like not comfortable with at first mm -hmm. because um growing up in America as a woman in the nineteen twenties, you were like I mean, it was so conservative, so you know, yeah, you were always supposed to be covered and you couldn't expose anything and then they want her to go like naked. She had, I think, like a feather over her and that was it. <clears throat> wow. So she was like, not about it, but then she's like, well, I just sailed across the fucking world. <laughs> yeah, I didn't come this far. <laughs> I need some money and I'm not going to go back. So yeah. she did it and it fucking set her up for life. So... After a successful tour of Europe, she broke her contract and returned to France instead to star alone and set the standard for her future acts. Her career thrived in the integrated Paris society. When La Revue Negre closed, closed, Josephine starred in La Folie de Du Jour at, at <laughs> the Folies Verger Theatre. Is that bad. all of that right? Her jaw, <laughs> her jaw dropping performance, including a costume of 16 bananas strung into a skirt, cemented her celebrity status. Josephine rivaled Gloria Swanson and Mary Pickford as the most photographed woman in the world, and by 1927, she earned more than any entertainer in Europe. Not only was she wealthy and well known to the public, but she was also popular with the stars. Ernest Hemingway said she was the most sensational woman I ever saw. Pablo Picasso painted several pictures of her. Artists and celebrities around the world couldn't get enough of Josephine Baker. It's so odd because she was so popular and so well known, and yet in America, people hardly know anything about her. Right, you know? because Americans are like, this is like nationalism is growing and growing mm -hmm. and growing. So, like, if you're not an American star, you're not anywhere. Like, you're it's nothing like, to us. It's like. What are those called? Horse blinders? Um, yeah, the blinders. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, yeah. you can only see America. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this person's incredible over here. They're not They're not mainstream America. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, it's so nationalist. Yeah, it really is. It still is. It's, it's no, still, it 100% it is. is. It's like America, like, the entire world, just to use one example, plays soccer. And soccer is the most, or football as it's yeah. called, the most popular sport in the world in America Nobody cares. Like, right. we just, we made up our own fucking football completely different. Yeah, literally. We don't care about soccer. And everybody in the world knows these football stars. And America's like, I don't care. Do you know who Tom Brady is? And literally. the rest of the world's like, no, we don't fucking know who Tom Brady is. He's literally a nobody in the grand scheme <laughs> of the world. But not in the grand scheme, yeah. I'm sure there are some people, but mostly through his wife. They're like, oh, you mean Giselle's husband? Yeah, sure, we know him. <laughs> right. So, she, Josephine, starred in a few movies as well during this time. Zuzu and Princess Tam. Tam Tam, the more well-known. She also released a song in 1931. She scored it, uh, the Jes d'Or Amours. I don't know. Um, with her international... I love when we put in these... I put in these words. <laughs> I'm like, great. You're good. Spell well, it. I don't know how to say it. Spell it like you say it. J-A-I-S. No, you could have put J-A-Y-S. Oh, oh, Jays. But I don't, Paul, I don't know how to say it in the first place. So I don't know how to spell it out in the way that we would say it. <laughs> I don't know how to say this stuff. Okay. Well, we, just, we just, we just go with it. You know what? Yeah. We just say what we want. J'adore amours. If Perfect. you say it like that, then it, it sounds like, you, like it. you know what you're saying. <laughs> so with her international <laughs> success and growing wealth, Josephine moved her family from St. Louis to Les Milans, her estate in France. During this time, her maid love and dress was Giuseppe Abatino, a former stonemason who passed himself off as a count. He lied and said, he, I am the Count <laughs> Abatino. And she's like, oh my God, okay, I count. How, how exotic. But hey, it wasn't. Uh, I'm the mayor. Nice <laughs> to meet you. That's right. That's how you <laughs> land someone, folks. You just go up with confidence and you tell them, I am a count. And if you're a bricklayer, it doesn't matter if she right. believes you. But Giuseppe did persuade Josephine to let him manage her, and under his management, Baker's stage and public persona, as well as her singing voice, were transformed. So he did, I mean, maybe he was just a stonemason, a bricklayer, but... He, he had a creative eye. He did. He, he, or a creative ear, maybe. Creative, yeah, he knew what he was, I mean, right. he knew enough to, like, take her act to the next level. Right. 
Yeah. Um, in 1936, Josephine returned to America as part of her world tour. However, things did not go smoothly. Despite the fact that she was a major celebrity in Europe, American audience rejected the idea of a black woman with so much sophistication and power. Newspaper reviews were equally cruel. And also, um, she got a hotel in New York, and it was like this high-end hotel, and they were like, oh, I mean, I guess you can stay here. Mm. But you're going to have to use the um, servant's entrance in the mm. back because we can't have the good white people of this country seeing you coming into our hotel. Exactly. It's like it's like if Taylor Swift or Lady Gaga went somewhere else and they're like, look, we're glad that you're here, but if you could just sneak in the back so nobody knew that you were here, like that's how insulting and degrading right. it was. She's a worldwide star mm -hmm. and they're making her sneak in the back just because she's black right it was really very insulting it's, yeah um where am i at oh in the reviews of her appearance in ziegfeld foley's time magazine referred to her as the n-word which we're definitely not going to say nope. wench um whose dancing and singing might be topped anywhere outside of paris which again shows the american arrogance that this worldwide store the like star they're like yeah. this wench she can't even sing it's like anybody outside of paris would be better than this woman right. as if paris isn't the epic center of, of culture right. and art and entertainment you dumb fucks like now <laughs> here in america we got all the entertainment we got the best stuff <laughs> um, while other critics said her voice was too thin and dwarf-like to fill the Winter Garden Theater, which she didn't use a microphone. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why she didn't use a microphone, but her voice did actually not fill the room. It wasn't her best performance. But that yeah. being said, if she had been white, the yeah. review may have been like, oh, she was a little quiet, but she was all around good. Four out of five. Yeah, she was off for a game. I mean, she admits that it wasn't her best performance. Right. I'm sure she's nervous. She's going back to America that it's never been good to her. Ever. And she's performing in front of uh, an audience that's already, like, just being thrown off. I mean, you're going back to America, and the first thing you encounter is, oh, could you come in the back? Like, you've been living openly and proud for the last decade, mm -hmm. not even thinking about your skin color. Right. And now you come to America and all of a sudden you're being forced to sneak in the back. That's going to throw you off mentally. Right. Like now you can't focus. You're just like you're facing this abrasive racism constantly that you right haven't had. Right from the start. Yeah, right from the start being put back into that. I mean it's like when we go back home or something. Yeah. And that's all, all you can think about is how like – how outside you feel in this place right. when you haven't been thinking of that before. when i go home to my family like at my family's <clears throat> house i feel great and i don't think about anything but then yeah. i go out into public yeah and i feel like um how did i say it last time like the walls are closing in like yeah. it's almost like claustrophobia because you just feel so compressed you have to like not be yourself yeah you have to be on guard about everything right. am i going to hold my partner's hand i wonder like am i going to go to the restroom like i the whole time i was in south carolina i just didn't pee in any public place because i wasn't going in the women's restroom and i didn't feel comfortable or safe going in the men's restroom and the thing is we can at least somewhat hide it yeah you know we can just walk through with our heads down or not you know just go pretend to go with the flow this was a, a person of color you, yeah. she can't hide her skin color exactly it's there it's out in front for everybody to see no matter what yeah so nothing she can do you know and so yeah and you just you feel just our little bit of exposure we know what it feels i can't imagine being a person of color a person a queer person of right. color back in america in the 1930s the worst and having to deal with this and then you know on top of it and this was actually like hollywood just started banning gay stuff and yeah so it was like it even the black yeah. balling like well this is the rise of the lavender scare this is when it starts to rise yep. a little bit before really taking off in the late 40s but yeah so um she had everything against her she really did and and so yeah it wasn't her best performance give her a fucking break so anyways where am i at? right here she returned to Europe heartbroken. However, when she landed, she was surrounded by a group of fans. So she got off the plane and yeah, all of these Europe, people yeah. surrounded her. They were so happy she was back. So she went home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Know? That was her home. Um, she, Upon returning, she obtained her, her third husband. She obtained her third husband. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, she went to Walmart. She just snagged him. In Paris in the she's, 1930s. She's like, you know what? It's been a minute since I've been married. <laughs> so she got her third husband, um, and she married the French industrialist Jean Leon. Leon. The, ma they ma the mayor, sorry. 
The mayor of their town presided over the wedding, and thus Josephine B Baker became a French citizen, renouncing her American citizenship. Sadly, there wasn't much time for celebration, as Europe was on the brink of war. Dun, dun, dun. In September of 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. <laughs> I'm on my typewriter in oh, the background. Oh, that's good, that's good. And sparked the beginning of World War II. The French beep, military... Beep, 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 beep. I'm sitting Norse oh, code oh, now. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> just switching up. <laughs> Thank you. Then your sound effects provided by Paul Hobbs today. Um, the French military intelligence soon recruited Josephine as an honorable correspondent, which just meant spy. Uh, Baker collected what information she could about German troop locations from officials she met at parties. She specialized in gatherings at embassies and ministries, charming people as she had always done while gathering information. Her cafe society fame enabled her to rub shoulders with those in the know, from high-ranking Japanese officials to Italian bureaucrats, and to report back what she heard. She attended parties and gathered information at the Italian embassy without raising any suspicion. This so. woman, <laughs> the woman that America shunned because yep. she was a black woman. That's the only reason they shunned yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, there was no reason. Literally. She is a successful, hugely popular, world famous. World, the most photographed woman in the world. What and now she's a actress. fucking spy. Now she's a spy in World War II. And America's still like, well, I don't know. Maybe if she was white, I don't know. A little, little overrated, if you ask maybe me. Maybe if she is a, a white man, she might have a better <laughs> chance at this world. <laughs> right, yeah. Maybe she'd do something. <laughs> Chill. Oh, it's me? <laughs> <laughs> when the Germans invaded France, Baker left Paris and went <clears throat> and went to her home at Chateau Le Chateau. Mil That's Chateau, one word I know. Chateau Le Melande in the south of France. She housed refugees and supplied visas to those who were eager to help the free French effort. As an entertainer, Baker had an excuse for moving around Europe, visiting neutral nations such as Portugal, as well as some in South America. She carried information for transmission to England about airfields, arbors, and German troop concentrations in the west of Europe. In order to hide her espionage notes, she wore them. She wrote them in invisible ink on her sheet music. She also yeah. hid things in her panties and also smuggled here. But go ahead. Oh, and also smuggled people and pretended they were her musicians. Yeah, she put them in her in her band and were like, "Oh, this is my drummer." And even though he doesn't know how to play the drums, and this guy plays the uh, the trumpet, and they would just stand in the corner and just like. <laughs> <laughs> imagine imagine how brave you have to be yeah. to be like all right let's go these are some french freedom fighters i got this stuff in my undergarments and i got my, my secret notes got my secret, written in invisible ink which is so cool i had so much invisible ink when i was a kid i would write everything in there nothing important but did, did you ever have no oh well you're missing out, Paul. <laughs> I'll have to get you some. It's nothing better. You just write it in. You write it in. How do you see it if it's invisible? You could put there. Well, there's different kinds. Some you could put under a light. Some of it, you would just you would write it, and then like ten minutes later, it would show back. It would show up on the page. So like it just looks empty, and then you she's would... like writing the note really quick. She's like, excuse me, boys. <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> Gotta get this out of here before it dries. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> Well, no. but yeah, it's hidden in her sheet music. Just she's just going around with her band, playing playing songs, mm -hmm. and then in the meanwhile, she's stealing all these secrets. In 1941, Josephine headed to the French colonies in North Africa. The stated reason was Baker's health, since she was recovering from another case of pneumonia. But the real reason was to continue helping the resistance. From a base in Morocco, she helped. To, she, from a base in Morocco, she made tours of Spain, and she penned notes with information she gathered inside her underwear. As I already spoiled. As sorry. he spoiled. Counting on her celebrity status to avoid a strip search, which I'm sorry, uh, but if she had come through my line, I would have made sure there was a strip alert. I'm sorry, ma'am, but we're going to have to search you. <laughs> Josephine Baker. No, I wouldn't have been, been a pervert, old man, but who knows? In another life, it's possible. <laughs> During this time, Josephine had a miscarriage. In fact, she had endured several in her life, but after this one, an infection developed, and it was so severe it required a hysterectomy. For several months, she was incredibly sick and heartbroken. Though she could never have children of her own, Josephine adopted 11 children and housed and fed countless more. She called her family the Rainbow Tribe and wanted to prove that children of all different ethnicities and religions could still be brothers. Because you're fucking taught to hate. You don't exactly. grow up with hate in your heart. 
And that's exactly what she was proving through her family. She would deliberately adopt these kids from all different, you mm-hmm. know, corners of the world and, you know, came up the term rainbow tribe long before it was ever a gay thing, right. you know, and, you know, and gave these kids a wonderful home. So as she struggled with her pain emotionally and physically, Josephine willed herself to rally to the cause and recovered. She then started touring to entertain British, French, and American soldiers in North Africa. The Free French had no organized entertainment network for their troops. So Baker and her entourage managed for the most part on their own. They allowed no civilians and charged no admission. This was another of the many ways that this incredible woman served her country and the world in the, fir- in the fight against Nazism. At the end of the war in 1945, she was awarded the Cross of War and the Resistance Medal by the new leader, Charles de Gaulle, and was named the, to the Legion of Honor, which is the highest French order of merit for military and civil merits. And I think she's still the only African-American-born woman to ever get that award. Really? She was no. at least the first. Yeah. I'm just saying that I think she's still, but I don't know yeah. if there has been another since then. All right. Um, during the war, Josephine's third marriage to Jean Leon. Leon had ended. The bitter ex-husband had banished Josephine from her state, which left her temporarily homeless during the greatest war the world had ever fought. Which is definitely what you'd be like, look, Josephine, I know you're out saving the world, but the truth is, you've really hurt my feelings, so you can just go sleep on the fucking street with our 11 kids. Fucking imagine. Nice job, Jean. Nobody remembers you. (laughs) But after things ended, and especially since Josephine was not only a celebrity but a war hero, the star had little trouble rebuilding her life. In 1947, she married for the final time to Joe Bullion, a composer. So in 1951, 15 years and one war later, the United States invites Josephine Baker back to her home to perform. (laughs) Now they're like, well, okay, I guess she kind of impressed us a little bit. (laughs) Still not a white man, but... But... But we like the way you dance around with those bananas, so why don't you come back here and we'll pretend that we don't find you as pretty as the white ladies. So the world-renowned entertainer agreed on one condition. She would not perform for any venues that were segregated. When she arrived in New York with her husband, they refused reser- they were refused reservations at 36 hotels because of racial discrimination. World-renowned star. Yep. Uh, World War II spy, one of the highest decorated women in World War II. Yeah. Uh, can't get a, like 36 hotels, like, sorry, can't stay here. Yeah. She was so upset by this treatment that she wrote articles about the segregation in the United States. She also began traveling into the South, lecturing at several universities on France, North America, North Africa, and the equality of races in France mm-hmm. to be like, hey, fuckheads, this is how you do it. Her her refusal to perform for segregated audience in the United States frustrated many business owners who wanted the smash sensation, but not her demands. One club in Miami offered her $10,000 if she would play the segregated venue. Josephine turned down the offer, and eventually the club met her demands. Her insistence on mixed audience helped to integrate live entertainment shows in Las Vegas, Nevada. After this incident, she began receiving threatening phone calls from people claiming to be from the Ku Klux Klan. Imagine this. She fought Nazis. Yeah. Like, she fought people who were really terrible people. She fought and, Hitler, bitch. Yeah. And you're this middle-aged white man with a belly. Well, you know what I do? <laughs> I get out there with my cross and I'll burn it in your yard. And she's like, fuck you. Come. Come to my house. She's like, I already built the cross for you, motherfucker. I got the match. You ready? (laughs) You ready to fucking go? But the star stated publicly that she wasn't afraid of the Klansmen, as she shouldn't have been because she was a badass bitch. Yeah. In 1951, Baker made charges of racism against Sherman Billingsley's Stork Club in Manhattan, where she had been refused service. Actress Grace Kelly, who was at the club at the time, rushed over to Baker, took her by the arm, and stormed out with her entire party, vowing never to return. The two women became close friends after the incident. When Baker was near bankruptcy, Kelly offered her a villa and financial assistance. Kelly, by by then, was the Princess of Morocco. Which I am jealous of that friendship because Grace Kelly is one of my favorite actresses and she's fucking gorgeous and that's a hot couple. But also, <laughs> um, that's an amazing, like, the Princess of Morocco is your friend right. now. like. She made she made a lot of high profile friends, Josephine Baker. Because not only I mean, she was a but she, she, she seemed a, to be a great person. Like yeah, everything yeah. I watched, like I got a very positive vibe for her. Like yeah. she is a genuinely 
good person. Yeah, you don't see, I didn't find things of like, you know, people that she had wronged or enemies. Right. Or, so she's just a good or person. Or like, yeah, she might have been nice on the stage, but when she got yeah, backstage, like yeah. there was nothing. Like a of Lucille that. Ball kind of thing, which I love Lucille Ball, but she was a bitch. But like, like a real bitch. And, um, but like, no, like Josephine was just a good, kind, down to earth woman. I mean, she adopted 11 foster children, right. so I don't know. And actually cared know. for them. It wasn't a publicity yeah, stunt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So regardless of the backlash against her, Josephine pressed on in her fight for civil rights in America. She worked with the NAACP and her reputation as a crusader grew to such an extent that the NAACP made Sunday, May 22nd, 1951, Josephine Baker Day. She was presented with a lifetime membership to the NAACP <laughs> and the honor spurred her to further her crusading efforts with the Save Willie McGee rally after he was convicted of the 1948 beating death of a furniture shop owner in Trenton, New Jersey. So that was a, another cause that she got behind. Um, as a decorated war hero who was bolstered by the racial equality she experienced in Europe, Baker became increasingly regarded as controversial. Some black people even began to shun her, fearing that her outspokenness and racy reputation from her earlier years would hurt the cause, which is similar to Bayard Rustin, right. yep. the uh, you know the person who created the 1963 March on Washington, the you know I Have a Dream March. Um, you know, so he's then when he was younger, he was caught in a car with two guys right. having a threesome, and you know people were like, well, I don't know, and you know despite his decades of fighting for. The civil rights movement, some people are like, well, I don't know if he should be representing our cause. Right. Now, can I just say that her life mm -hmm. makes me fucking tired? Yeah, right? Like, I'm Step, exhausted. Like, number one, she becomes a worldwide sen sensation. Yeah. Most photographed person in the world. Like, I would have stopped On there. the highest earning actresses. I would have stopped. And like, that's it, but, I'm good. But then she was like, you know what? I'm going to go fight in World War II and fight the fucking Nazis. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting a little tired. <laughs> now she's like, let's fucking crush racism in America. You wonder why she has four husbands. The guys can't keep up with her. No. They're like, you're fucking nuts, lady. Take <laughs> a breath. Right? And well, can we can we sit on the couch and watch Netflix? And she's like, sorry, <laughs> fighting the Nazis. Sorry, I can't. Gotta smuggling. smuggle these things out in my panties. <laughs> then I gotta go meet Grace for Kitty. tea. You mean fucking Grace Kelly? Yes. The princess of Morocco? Yes. Oh, and then and I'm gonna Jackie's go... coming over. Jackie Kennedy, you heard of her. And then I'm gonna go crush racism in America on yeah. the side. That's the my side job. Oh, and I'm taking the 11 kids with me because someone's <laughs> got to make sure that they're okay. Like... <laughs> Maybe John wasn't an asshole. Maybe it was just like, look, Joe, I just, I can't do it anymore. I, you need to leave because this is too much, please. I, I would get, get anxiety just from like, right? that's a lot. You know what? Then Facebook came along and everybody just sits on their phone now. And they just, yeah, they just sit on their phone. Not to mention in the midst of all this, I mean, she maintained a very active sex life. So, she was keeping that healthy as well. Gotta keep that healthy. You do. You really do. I don't know when she had time for that. But. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. But when I bet it was sleep? fun. I've got a secret note for you written in invisible ink in my panties. You just have to find it and you have to read it. <laughs> Dig through the bananas. <laughs> so in 1963, she spoke at the March on Washington at the side of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., um, Baker was the only official female speaker. Not everyone involved wanted Baker president at the march. Some thought her time overseas had made her a woman of France, one who was disconnected from the civil rights issues going on in America. In her powerful speech, one of the things Baker notably said was, I have walked into the palaces of kings and queens and into the houses of presidents, and much more, but I could not walk into a hotel in America and get... Oh. <laughs> but I could not walk into a hotel in America and get a cup of coffee. And that made me mad. And when I get mad, you know, that I open my big mouth. And then look out, because when Josephine opens her mouth, they hear it all over the world. And then I go, and I fight in the war, and I... And I adopt my 11 kids. She gives me anxiety. And I change this. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a lot. I, swear, I just can't even read about you because it's too much. So for the next decade, Josephine continued her fight for equality, the fight for equality, while still performing all over the world, just squeezing it in in between gigs. Her immense sacrifice during the war, combined with her controversial image and growing uh, age, left or growing, I should say, her controversial image and growing age, yeah, left her nearly penniless toward the end of the life of her life. But her good friend, Grace Kelly, was there to take care of her, as well as her many children and friends across the globe. 
On April 8, 1975, Josephine starred in a retrospective review at the Balbino in Paris, Josephine Abobino, 1975, celebrating her 50 years in show business. The review, financed notably by Grace Kelly and Jackie Kennedy, opened to the rave reviews. Demand for the seating was such that fold-out chairs had to be added to accommodate spectators. The opening night audience included Sophia Loren, Mick Jagger, Shirley Bassey, Diana Ross, and Liza Minnelli. Four days later, Baker was found lying peacefully in her bed, surrounded by newspapers with glowing reviews of her performance. She was in a coma after suffering a cerebral hemorrhage. She was taken to the hospital where she died at age 68 on April 12, 1975. That's how she went. Survived, surrounded by reviews of how amazing her final performance had been. It is. It is a beautiful way. I just... Uh, yeah, that was that was the life. That's the life, kid. Nobody tops that. Nobody tops you that. You can't life. top that. You can't. She lived more lives in one life than I, so many people. Like, and just an amazing woman. And some people won't move out of the same town they went to high school in. Like, I know, right? <laughs> we got two ends it's of the sad. spectrum here. It's sad. There's so many things that she did. Fighting, uh, you know, in in not against Nazism. Fighting for well, our, racial uh, our, equality. Our president wouldn't even go to Vietnam because yeah. he had. Bone spurs. He had bone spurs. Yeah, but he's the president of the fucking United States, the same country that wouldn't allow Josephine Baker to stay in a hotel mm-hmm. because she was black, even though she fought Nazis. Even but... though she, yeah, no, no. But thirty-six hotels were like, no, sorry, but definitely make Donald Trump the funky president of the United States and defend him to the death, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we love patriots. Okay, we're gonna be mad at Colin Kaepernick for kneeling during the national anthem because he's opposing uh, racism that's still prevalent in America, mm-hmm. but we're going to be okay with voting in a draft dodger. Makes a lot of fucking sense, people. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, but anyways, so that is for you. We, we, we Hopefully this episode makes it to you. It's the second time we recorded it. <laughs> Good luck. Because Cross there's not going to be a third time. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that. It'll like, be alive the third time. Yeah, it will be. Just me and Paul standing on the street corner shouting it out so we get it out somehow. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, please make sure again, um, A Hungry Heart, uh, The Josephine Baker Story by Jean-Claude Baker. Read it. That's your recommended resource if and you can get a hold of it. If you don't want to read it but you want more information, mm-hmm. go to YouTube, type in Josephine Josephine Baker. There yeah. are two great documentaries yeah. that you can watch, that you can listen to. You don't even have to watch. You can listen to it podcast style. They are phenomenal. And you can uh, you actually get to hear her sing a couple oh, songs okay. in it. Yeah. And she has a beautiful voice yeah. on top of her beautiful everything Make sure else. you look up some pictures. Um you know, and behave yourselves. <laughs> she's a, she's a classy woman, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, and also if you can go to our Patreon, your queer story, um, and donate even a dollar or con- you know contribute, join um, us, join us. Uh, we appreciate it. It helps us keep this podcast going, and uh, we appreciate you guys. So stay queer. Don't get a lobotomy. We love you, our suckling taffets. And our super sexy allies. That's right. And uh, bye. Goodbye. <laughs>